Good morning and happy Easter to you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. You know that that Easter greeting is familiar to many of us. It goes back to the earliest part of the first century. In fact, the custom seems to have originated with the Orthodox Church, and they have the tradition that Mary Magdalene actually gave that Easter greeting to Emperor Tiberius in the year 37 AD. And the biblical reference that's often cited is Luke chapter 24, where Luke says and proclaims, the Lord is risen indeed. And that Easter greeting is often a part of Easter celebrations, and in fact are today all over the world. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. You know, in the early part of the 20th century, Nikolai Bukharin was one of the most powerful men on earth. He was a Russian communist leader, and he took part in and helped to lead the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. And there is a story that is told about a journey he took. He went from Moscow to Kiev in 1930 to address a huge crowd. And the subject, of course, was atheism. And he attacked Christianity. And he, he took time to try to convince the crowd. And at the end of his talk, he was confident that he had convinced the crowd that they should reject Christ and embrace atheism. And as the story goes, he turned the meeting over to the, the Orthodox priest, and the, the priest complimented him on his eloquence. Then turning to the crowd, he dismissed them, saying, Christ is risen. And the people stood to their feet and passionately exclaimed as with one thundering voice, he is risen indeed. No matter, no matter what people had said to those people, they knew in their hearts the essential gospel message that Christ has risen indeed. Well, for the previous six Sundays during this season of Lent, leading up to this Easter Sunday, we've been working through a series of messages on doubts and doubting, and what causes us at times to doubt God's existence and or God's power, God's faithfulness, God's goodness, and, and even God's grace and mercy. And what we've seen over these past six weeks, that doubting doesn't disqualify us, but rather is often a part of our faith journey. And in addition, we've understood that God is, is certainly big enough to handle our doubts, and His Word has given us plenty of assurance and guidance on how to navigate our doubts to strengthen our faith and to, to move us beyond our doubts toward belief and away from unbelief. And on this Resurrection Sunday, we want to take to heart the objective fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave as what is understood to be the central truth in facing our doubts and in coming to a a growing and vital relationship with God through faith in the risen Jesus. You know, the first century Christians believed Jesus loved them before the Bible told them so. Like the, the familiar children's song, Jesus Loves Me, says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, they didn't have the New Testament scriptures, but what they did have, what they did have was this one fact, this one fact that changed their lives, and that fact was that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead, that he was alive. The foundation of their faith was not that something was written down, but that something had happened, and that the ultimate answer to our doubts in this broken and post-Christian world that we live in is a world-changing event that took place on that first Easter morning. The Apostle Paul, who later went on to write a majority of the, of the New Testament in the Bible, was, a, was an enemy of the early believers in Jesus, till one day 
in a miraculous way, the risen Jesus met Paul, as he was known as Saul then, as he was headed to Damascus. And his intent was to arrest a group of the early Christ followers and actually put them on trial and have them put to death. And Paul, through his own encounter with the risen Christ, became convinced of the truth that Jesus was, in fact, alive. And so he later wrote in a letter to the church in Corinth these words, if Christ, he said, has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith, your faith, is also in vain. You see, the resurrection of Jesus on that first Easter Sunday morning is the underpinning and foundation of our journey through our doubts. It's an amazing and true story that's recorded for us in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I want you to hear today the story uh, from Luke's perspective, as he said at the beginning of his writing of his Gospel, that he wrote it down actually for his friend Theophilus, so that in his doubts, Luke writes, so he could be certain of the truth of who Jesus was and what he had come to do. So here is Luke's account of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, as recorded for us in Luke chapter 24. He says, but on the first day of the week, at early in the morning, the women went to the tomb with the spices that they had prepared. And they found the stone was rolled away from the tomb. And they went inside the tomb, though they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood beside them dressed in dazzling clothes. And the women, the women were terrified. And they bowed down on the ground. But the men said to them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered, delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified? And on the third day, rise? And they remembered his words. And re Turning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them like an idle tale, and they did not believe the women. But Peter rose, and he ran to the tomb. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling. He went home marveling at what had happened. You know, over the centuries, people have wrestled with their doubts about the possibility and the truth of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But from Luke's account, I think today, I'd like for us to observe several realities that Luke would have wanted his friend Theophilus, and I believe us, to understand, which would point to the resurrection being true. First, the tomb was empty. Now this may be the strongest proof that Jesus rose from the dead, the fact that the tomb was empty. Now, among skeptics, there are at least two major theories that have been advanced by those who doubt that the tomb was empty. Either they say someone stole Jesus' dead body, or secondly, ah, the women and the disciples went to the wrong tomb. But thinking about that, we know that the Jews and Romans had no motive to steal the body. And Jesus' followers were too cowardly and would have also had to overcome the Roman guards who were told were sent there to guard the tomb. 
And the women who found the tomb empty had earlier watched Jesus' body being placed there, so they knew where the correct tomb was. And even if they had gone to the wrong tomb, the religious leaders could have produced the body from the right tomb and stopped the resurrection stories. And you know, and most importantly, the angel said that Jesus had risen from the dead. <laughs> the tomb was empty. The fact was the tomb was empty and no one, no one could produce a dead body. But I think there's a second proof of the resurrection in Luke's account. And that is this, that the women were eyewitnesses. The women mentioned in Luke's account, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James and other women. Luke says these were the first eyewitnesses to the empty grave. Now, if, if Luke's story had been made up, if this was just an attempt to tell a tale that wasn't true, hey, no ancient author would have used women as the first witnesses to Christ's re resurrection. I'm sorry. In that time, women were considered second-class citizens. In fact, their testimony was not even allowed in court. Yet Luke, Luke and all the gospel writers say the risen Christ first appeared to Mary Magdalene and to the other women. Well, even the, the disciples did not believe the women when they told them the tomb was empty. But you got to love Jesus because he always had a special respect for these women. He honored them. He honored them as their first eyewitnesses to his resurrection. And the gospel writers, while inspired by the Holy Spirit, had no choice. They had no choice but to report this awkward act of God's favor because that was how it happened. And it's true. The fact is the tomb was empty. And the fact is the women were the first to hear that Jesus was alive. But I believe there's a third proof of the truth of the resurrection in this story. And that is what we see as the honest doubt of the apostles. The first response to the report from the women by Jesus' closest followers, that is his disciples, is doubt and skepticism. Look at verse 11. It says, their words seem to them like an idle tale or nonsense, some translations say. And it says, they did not believe the women. And after Christ's death, we're told in other gospels that Jesus' apostles hid behind locked doors, terrified that they would be found and then executed next. But something changed them from cowards to bold preachers. And you know, anyone who understands human character knows people do not change that much without some major event or influence. And friends, that influence was seeing Jesus, I believe, bodily risen from the dead. And in Luke's gospel, as the story continues in Luke chapter 24, Jesus appears first to Cleopas and his friend on the road to Emmaus, and then to the disciples in the locked room, and then on Mount Olive as he prepares to de depart. And after seeing Jesus alive, Peter and the others left the locked room and preached the risen Christ, unafraid of what would happen to them. And they stopped hiding because they knew the truth that Jesus was alive. So, friends, if you find yourself doubting the resurrection, hey, you're in good company. And Jesus understands our doubts. He welcomes them. To those who are skeptical and struggling with belief, Jesus remains ready to receive our questions. And he'll listen to our doubts. And he also invites belief, as he did with Thomas, a disciple of Jesus, who for some reason was not with the rest of the disciples when Jesus appeared to the group. And as a result, the disciples reporting their excitement about the experience of seeing the risen Christ tell Thomas and Thomas, who needless to say has his doubts, he says, I need to see some proof. And in John's gospel, he says, unless, 
I see in his hands the marks of the nails and place my finger into the marks in his hands and place my hand into his side, those wounds I will never believe. Now, Thomas's critics are quick to point out his stubborn insistence that he not only see but also touch Jesus, the Christ, and his body, but his wounds as well. But aren't you glad this morning? Aren't you glad there was someone who didn't just take the word of others, but he wanted to know this truth for himself? You know, in the History Channel's docudrama of the Bible, this scene, this scene of Thomas doubting that Jesus is alive is tenderly captured with the resurrected Jesus slowly making his way over to Thomas. He makes his way over to Thomas, and he gently places his hand on his shoulder, and he says, do not disbelieve, but believe. And though the witness of the women to the resurrection was initially met with disbelief, Jesus, Jesus has patience with her doubts, and he had patience with the doubts of the apostles, including Thomas. And the good news, friends, of Easter is that the tomb is empty. Jesus is not there. He is risen. And so only one question remains. One question remains. How will you and how will I respond? And we see several possible responses highlighted in our story here in Luke's gospel this morning. First, there was the response of the women. And we see their response in verses 9 and 10. It says, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. The women came back from the tomb, and they told all these things to the apostles and to everyone there with them. Now, they must have certainly have still been frightened. They must have been somewhat confused. They certainly did not understand all that happened. But it says that they remembered what Jesus had said. And they believed his words. And there was one thing they could do. They could share what they knew. They could share that the body was no longer in the tomb. They could share that the angel said he had risen from the dead. The women believed, and they shared their faith with others. Friends, are you a believer in Jesus' resurrection this morning? Do you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Paul, writing in Romans chapter 10, says, then you will be saved. And if so, you and I are called to join in the mission of God to share our faith with others. Just like the women at Jesus' tomb, empty tomb, he died, he rose again from the dead, he's alive, and he sent his spirit to live in us and to live through us. That's good news, and good news is for sharing. And what better way today to respond to the good news of the resurrection than to share with others. That's the first possible response this morning. Believe the good news and share it with others. Where you live, where you work, where you play. Who comes to mind this morning who needs to knew, know that message of the good news? that Jesus is alive. If no one comes to mind, then I would just invite you to start by saying, Lord, show me who that person is. Show me who I can proclaim the good news of the resurrection to. Believe and share. But we can also see another possible response here in Luke's rec record of the resurrection, and that was the response of the apostles, or at least their initial response. 
As we said, the women's response was believe and share. The apostles' initial response was don't believe and do nothing. Look at verse 11. So they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like an idle tale. Some translations say nonsense. They didn't believe the women. The women believed the good news of Easter, and they shared that faith with others. The apostles did not believe, and so they did nothing. Now, I'm happy to report, as I said to you before, that the apostles later changed their minds about this, but their initial response reflects the response of so many people today. And maybe it's your response. They don't believe at all. It can't be possible. It all seems like an idle tale, nonsense. And so they do nothing. Some even dismiss the story of Jesus outright. Or they hear the words, but they continue to live as their lives as if nothing happened that first Easter morning. I'm wondering, is that your response this morning? Have you heard the Easter story before, but have never really done anything about it? Have you ever thought, well, you know, that's okay for older people, but uh, all those older people at church, but it has nothing to do with me. If so, I just want to share with you that I believe you're missing out on the most wonderful news in all the world, that Jesus is alive. And if Jesus rose from the dead, that means that if you trust your life to him, he will bring you to life. He will give you life. He will give you life. Well, what does resurrection look like? You may ask. Well, first, resurrection life resurrects our relationship with God. You see, the Bible says that sin separates us from God and removes us from a relationship with God. But by believing in Jesus Christ, we're brought back into a relationship with God. We we're actually brought from death to life. Paul, writing to the church in the city of Ephesus, said this, but we were dead in our trespasses and sins, which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now a work of the sons of disobedience. We were by nature children of wrath. But God, it says, who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with him, for by grace we've been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in heavenly places, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. You see, Resurrection life resurrects a relationship with God that it was broken. But secondly, it raises our purpose with God. We've been given a calling, a mission, if you will, of spreading God's grace and love to others, of living it out, allowing him to live through us. Ephesians goes on to say, it's by grace we're saved, through faith, not of ourselves, it's the gift of God not by works, lest anyone one should boast, but he says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, this resurrection life not only resurrects us into a new relationship with God, but it resurrects us into a new purpose of living with God. As we live it out, we live out our faith, in a way that shows God's love to others. No longer an idle tale. No longer nonsense, but life, real life. So are those the only two options you ask, either to believe that Jesus rose from the dead or to not believe? 
Well, you know, at first it might seem so, but you know, there really is one other option that we see in Luke's uh, story. We find this third option shown for us by Peter's response here in verse 12. It says of Peter, Peter, it says, however, rose, and it says he ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, the clothes that had wrapped Jesus' body, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Peter's response was to check it out for himself. And if you're not sure of what to make of Jesus' resurrection, there is a third option. Rather than simply rejecting it out of hand as nonsense or, or not doing anything with it, thinking it has no relevance to your life, you can do what Peter did. You can check it out for yourself. I'm sure Peter must have had doubts about what the women were saying. But instead of not doing anything, he ran to the tomb. In essence, he doubted his doubts. He examined the evidence there, the empty tomb. He saw the the stone that was rolled away. He stooped down. He looked into the empty tomb. He saw the clothes lying there by themselves. And he went. He went looking for Jesus. It says he marveled at what he saw. He went looking for Jesus. Do you know what? He found him. Or Jesus found him. Not lying, dead in a tomb, but resurrected and alive. It's interesting to note that the Bible tells us that Jesus appeared First to the women, but out of all the apostles, he appeared to Peter first, before he appeared to the other ten. How do we know that? By what the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Here's the gospel. Here's the earliest creed that was written by the early church. Many believed within 10 years of Christ's death, within years of his death and resurrection, these words are written down and repeated by the early church, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. He appeared to Peter, and then to the other apostles. This must have taken place sometime after Peter left the tomb. Peter was not yet ready to believe that Jesus was alive, but he did not dismiss dismiss it as nonsense. Instead, he ran to the tomb. He checked it out for himself, and he went home marveling. And as he did so, he encountered the living Christ, and his life was changed. So my question for us today is what will be our response? Like the apostles, seems like nonsense and do nothing and miss the power and the life of the resurrection that God wants to offer us. Or you may be stooping down like Peter and looking into that empty tomb right now, and you're wondering if this is true. And as you too doubt your doubts like Peter did, may you, may the living Christ encounter you as you sincerely and honestly seek the truth about the empty tomb. Or I invite you like the women. They saw the empty tomb. They remembered what Jesus had said, and they believed and began to share the good news. I invite you today to turn to the risen Christ and remember what he said he would do and believe. Turn in faith to the one who died our death and gave us life through his resurrection so that we might have the promise of life before death on this earth and life after death spiritual death, 
spiritual life, physical death, physical life. The angels asked the woman that the women that first Easter morning, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. And they remembered. And they believed. And they shared the good news. And may that be so for us as well on this Easter Sunday morning. Because Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray. Risen Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, how we praise you and how we thank you for the resurrection life that you are living today at the right hand of the Father. And thank you for reminding us, Lord, that we have a, an opportunity to respond to either not believe and to write it off as nonsense or, or to stoop down and to peer inside the empty tomb and to wonder. And Lord, you're not going to turn us away. So we thank you that you accept our honest doubts. Risen Christ, meet us as we seek to doubt our doubts. But Lord, may we be like Mary Magdalene and the other women. And believe. Remember what you've done, what you said you would do. Remember what you've done on the cross. And, and remember that the tomb is empty. And go from this place to share that good news. May your Holy Spirit come. Give us a love for the lost. May we proclaim you Christ risen in all we do and say. For your glory we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So go this week now, friends, believing and trusting in the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and thus being a child of God sent to do his will. And as you have been given new life through faith in the risen Christ, so may his life flow through you to others. And as you receive new life, so freely share the truth about the risen Savior, Jesus, full of grace, and doing good among all you will meet where you live, work, and play. May God bless you as you go to love and serve the Lord. Amen.